All right, so before we started uh, fully new into chapter 11, I wanted to take a moment and kind of clean up a little bit from chapter eight and give us a chance to do another kind of problem um, that would uh, be something that you would see potentially in a homework problem or, or otherwise. Um, and so this is another solution stoichiometry kind of problem um, where we've got um, perchloric acid, HClO4, reacting with calcium hydroxide. Um, and we wanna know how much of this perchloric acid solution would I need to neutralize 50 grams of this calcium hydroxide? And so before we can do any of that, we need to have a balanced chemical equation. Balanced chemical equation is gonna give us calcium hydroxide reacting with perchloric acid to make calcium perchlorate, uh, this would be the salt in the neutralization, and water. And so to balance it, I would need two perchloric acids to match up the perchlorates here. And now I have two hydrogens and two hydroxides, so I would make two waters here. So now we got our balanced chemical equation. Now, if we go back to our mole map here, we are starting at grams of our substance. This is their grams of calcium hydroxide. And we want to follow this through from grams to moles of calcium hydroxide. And if we follow it all the way through, we're gonna go from grams of calcium hydroxide to moles of calcium hydroxide, moles of calcium hydroxide to moles of perchloric acid, and then we'll use molarity to go from moles of perchloric acid to a volume of perchloric acid, either in liters or milliliters, depending upon what is you know, more reasonable for us. So that's our overall process. Now coming back to our concept here, here's our balanced chemical equation. We're gonna start with the 50.00 grams of calcium hydroxide. That's the information that we definitely know. And we saw in the previous slide, this is going to be a three step, three calculation process. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw in those three calculations now, and we're just going to fill them in as we go. And so, first thing I need, um, if I'm going to go from grams of calcium hydroxide. to moles of calcium hydroxide.
So I'm going to go in that direction. I need a molar mass. Mass of calcium is 40.08. Mass of each hydrogen is 1.01, .01, and there are two of them. Mass of each oxygen is 16, and there are two of them. I end up with 74. Point one zero grams of calcium hydroxide for every mole. And so my first step, my grams of calcium hydroxide cancel out. In my second step, I want to go from moles of calcium hydroxide to moles of perchloric acid. And so to that, to that end, I'm going to need from the balanced chemical equation, one mole of calcium hydroxide for two moles of perchloric acid. That's gonna get my moles of calcium hydroxide to cancel. I've got moles of perchloric acid now. And then the last step, we need to utilize this definition of molarity. Remember that molarity equals moles of something per liters of solution. And so 0.115 molar means I have 0 0.115 moles of perchloric acid per one liter of solution. And so remember, anything I can link together with equal signs, I can put together in a fraction. So I've got moles on the bottom, 0.115 moles of perchloric acid in one liter of solution, that's going to cause my moles of perchloric acid to cancel. And so I do all the calculations here. 50 times 2 divided by 74.10 divided by 0.115 to three significant figures, three because of the concentration of the perchloric acid, I get 11.7 liters. Oh, make sure I did that right. 50 times two divided by 74.1, yeah, divided by 0 0.115, 11.7 liters of the solution. So sounds like a lot, <laughs> it certainly is. Um, but when you consider how dilute this particular solution is and how much 50 grams of, of the uh, calcium hydroxide is in the solid form, um, yeah, it's gonna take a lot of solution to get that to neutralize. Uh, so Obviously, if you were going to do this, you would, you would try to pick something that's a little bit more concentrated um, than this to do that neutralization. You know, maybe you pick something in the two or three molar range where um, instead of 11.7 liters, it might take maybe 500 milliliters or, or something like that. All right, any questions about this calculation uh, before we move off of uh, solution stoichiometry?
All right, so it's sounding like no. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, move on here. So just a couple more concepts to kind of clean up and, and look at from the perspective of, of solutions. Um, when it comes to forming solutions, we know that in terms of how quickly we can get a solution to be made, there are a couple of things that can come into play. So first of all, if I'm trying to make a solution, um, I want to get that solution to come together as quickly as possible, um, not only for the speed of, of uh, being able to distribute all those molecules evenly, but just from a standpoint of understanding um, and you know, from sanity perspective, if you're standing there trying, you know, for 20 minutes to get all the, the solution to dissolve, it's kind of maddening because you know that you need to do things with that. So how do we make it go faster? Well, first of all, we can look at things like particle size. So if I take something and I crush it, um, a powdered solid or a flake solid or something that has a lot of surface area, is going to dissolve way more easily than something that's big and bulky. Um, and you, you've seen this. Um, if you have rock salt and try to dissolve it uh, compared to granulated salt or you know iodized salt, the, the, the very fine particles, um, the iodized salt, the, the table salt, dissolves way, way faster. And the main reason is surface area. There's more total surface area exposed to the solution in that scenario where we've got those fine little crystals compared to a rock salt scenario. Now, in some cases, we use that particular idea to our advantage. When we use rock salt to do things like um, salt our driveway in the winter to help melt the ice, um, the size of those particles does help in the sense that they don't all immediately dissolve. And if they all immediately dissolve, they have a chance to be washed away and um, the driveway can refreeze or the sidewalk can refreeze. The size of the particles there actually helps by causing the ice to melt quickly, but leaving enough residual behind that it can survive a little bit uh, longer. Uh, and you don't have to go out there and constantly re-salt. Um, another factor, agitation, stirring. Um, putting a little bit more energy into it by causing the water and the salts or whatever to um, move around and find new interaction points will help with the um, agitation, will help with the dissolving of the substance. And then finally, the most important one, the, the, the easiest one, is temperature. Um, when we do things with temperature, then what we're seeing is that um, we're going to get higher interactions, greater interactions, um, because the kinetic energy is higher, and so the particles are moving around more quickly, and we're going to get better interactions more often. So those three factors come into play when choosing how to get a solution to form the most quickly. Now, what about concentration? Um, when it comes to concentration, we've, we've focused on quantitative aspects of, of concentration, molarity, percent by mass, uh, parts per million, that kind of thing. From a qualitative standpoint, we can describe solutions in three ways. There are saturated solutions. Saturated solutions are solutions that, have, that are basically packed full of solute. So much so that if I try to put more solute in there and get it to dissolve, it won't. That's what a saturated solution is. So saturated solutions are completely full of solute. And we can't add any more solute without changing the temperature. Now, usually increasing it considerably. Um, unsaturated solutions are exactly the opposite. They are not completely full. 
they have room to add. And so if I have an unsaturated solution and I add more solute to it, the solute will dissolve. And it'll continue to dissolve until we hit that saturation limit. But there's a third phenomenon here that is worth understanding. It's called supersaturation. Now, supersaturation is something that is an interesting phenomenon, um, but it's not a terribly common phenomenon. Um, yes, there are certain substances that are capable of supersaturation, but for the most part, they are, uh, they're not as common as you might think. Um, and so what supersaturation is, is um, usually what happens is we take a solution that is saturated, we warm it up, and as we warm it, that increases the solubility limit. So we heat it up to a higher temperature, we take advantage of the increased solubility at that higher temperature by adding more solute, and adding more solute and getting it to dissolve, and then we gradually bring the temperature back down. Now, in some cases, the solution will recognize, hey, I'm at a lower temperature, and it'll start dropping the extra solute. But in some cases, it doesn't do that. And so what it does is it keeps a, the extra solute in place where it is. And, that's an interesting kind of phenomenon because usually what that means is you've got the solution that it has an excess solute in it and the excess solute won't come out, at least not initially. Um, Supersaturated solutions are what we would call metastable, meaning they appear to be stable. They have all the appearances of looking like they are stable but just a slight bit of variance added to it can really set it apart and, and make it um, different and change its dynamics. And so I'll show you what I mean um, by pulling up a video here uh, of sodium acetate. And so what's gonna happen, sodium acetate has a saturated limit inside of the solution and what we'll do is we can heat up the solution, add extra sodium acetate, and let it cool down. And then we'll get a real good look of that at that metastability. So uh, watch along with me here. All right. Supersaturated solution of sodium acetate in water. A small crystal of sodium acetate will be added to the solution. Focus your attention on the portion of the solution in which the crystal is added. Okay, so a couple things to just point out here before we, we get into this. And so you uh first of all, you should be able to see on the neck of the flask here, there's some condensation. Um, that's, that, again, that's how they got the supersaturation to occur in the first place. You heat the solution up, probably to near boiling. You add a whole bunch of extra solute, so we added a whole bunch of extra sodium acetate to it, and then you gradually cool it down. And so he's now going to add what is called a seed crystal. Uh, so a seed crystal is just a small crystal of the substance doesn't actually have to be the substance. The effect that we're about to see, the snowing out effect, can occur with things like dust, can occur with things like agitation, where literally you just take a stir rod or something and you scratch the bottom of the, of the, the flask and um, the rough surface that, that uh, results uh, will give the same effect as well. So we just watch. And so you can see this is where the crystal hit and we're getting immediate reaction here. It's not actually a reaction in terms of a chemical reaction. 
nothing is changing chemically, but what we are seeing is that um, that seed crystal is causing the excess uh, sodium acetate to start to snow out here. And so by the end, all of that excess sodium acetate comes out. And so this is what we mean by metastability. Um, it is stable. If we had just left it on that table there, it would have stayed a solution until we had some other kind of, of uh, some kind of other interaction take place to replace it, um, to break that metastability and, and carry it on from there. So we, we kind of take that um, as it were, and that's ultimately what is going to happen. Um, and so we can see that this kind of, of interaction can happen. Um, and some of the results are pretty cool. So, so supersaturation, this can occur with a number of different places. And so this, this one right here, this is actually a different compound. It's a sodium thiosulfate instead of sodium acetate. But the same kind of effect is noticed. So in, in your, uh, your crystal mines, um, stalactites and stalagmites, um, those are the processes, um, supersaturation is one of the processes that results in these kinds of crystal formations occurring, where we had super saturated solutions of uh, usually salt under, in uh, underground mines. And as the dynamics of the underwater solutions changed, massive formations of, of these salted out uh, crystals formed and you get these big bulky um, crystals that form as a result. All right, any questions about solutions or reactions in solution? Anything in chapter eight before we wrap it up? All right, hearing none. Um, let's take a minute and go now into chapter 11. And so we're actually going to start chapter 11 um, by looking at and reviewing how we ended chapter 8. And so chapter 8, we finished by looking at concentrations. We looked at concentrations of molarity. We looked at the ratio based mass concentrations of percent by mass, parts per million, parts per billion. We're going to start this chapter by introducing a couple of other concentration units because what we find is that these particular concentration units work really, really well for the applications where they're used, but there are some limitations to them. One of the limitations is that we've got to deal with a volumetric unit in molarity. And that's not always a problem, but there are some problematic components to it. Because volume does change with temperature. And so if I'm looking at something that might potentially have temperature increases associated with it, 
then there's no guarantee that the temperature is going to maintain a constant volume as those temperature increases are occurring. We know that when temperature increases, things tend to expand, which means that my volume is expanding while my moles are staying the same. My molarity is potentially decreasing you know, and potentially significantly with increases in temperature. And so with that in mind, we need to think of some other kinds of units of concentration that might be important, might be useful to us that don't rely on that volumetric component. And so one of those is something called molality. Now in molality, notice that we have the same numerator, moles of solute, but this time our denominator has changed to be something that is mass-based, kilograms of solvent. Now, moles and kilograms, both of those are substance uh, measurements that do not depend at all on temperature whatsoever. And so from that result and to that end, we don't see temperature dependence with molality. Um, and so when we have large temperature fluctuations to consider, molality is a really good option. Now, the obvious issue with molality is that instead of being able to simply measure the volume of the solution, I have to know how many kilograms of solvent there are. And that can be a little bit problematic, especially if we don't make the solutions ourselves. But what we can do is we do have the capability that if we know the density of the solution, we can easily convert between molarity and molality. And so molarity we tend to use, um, especially when we're dealing with things that we wanna be able to measure volumetrically. We use it for all of our stoichiometric kinds of calculations. Um, and it works really well for those, those circumstances. But there, we will see in this chapter that there are circumstances where we want something else, where molality is going to be more appropriate. Now, as I said um, before, we can go from molarity to molality if we know the density of the solution. And knowing the density of the solution isn't actually um, as difficult as you might think because we can easily measure density um, just by taking the mass of a, of a sample of solution and then taking its volume. Um, or if that's given to us, it's a relatively short ladder of calculations that will allow us to make that conversion um, and allow us to go between one and the other. So very similar to what we saw in chapter eight, where we were able to convert between mass percent and molarity, we'll be able to do molarity to molality with similar kinds of calculations in tow. The big difference is that there's going to be an addition step and there's going to be a conversion step. The addition step is what is ultimately going to uh, be able for us to tie together the concept of density and the concept of uh, solvent mass. So if I know how much the solution weighs and I know how much solute I have, I can figure out the mass of solvent. Or if I know how much solvent I have and how much solute I have, I can add those together to get the mass of the solution. So really the conversion between molarity and molality falls into two parts. Um, in either case, we're going to need to do a conversion between moles and grams, moles and grams of solute. Um, and almost always we have to figure out the mass of the solute in some kind of way. We have to be able to determine the grams of the solution 
Um, or if we know the grams of solution, we have to flip that and figure out grams of solvent. And then finally, we have to be able to turn the mass of the solution into milliliters of solution. So these three conversions or calculations get involved in every kind of conversion between these two. We're going to either use um, density to turn volume of solution into mass or mass of solution into volume, depending upon which way we're going. Are we going from molality to molarity or vice versa? We're always going to have to figure out the number of grams of solute. Um, and that's just found by taking the moles of solute and multiplying by the molar mass. And then we're going to have to use that combination in some kind of way to either figure out the number of grams and kilograms of solvent, or if we know how much solvent there is, we add that to the amount of solute to figure out the grams of solution. So those three conversions, those are always going to be factored in one way or another. So let's do an example of just that. Let's determine the molality of a 0.194 molar nitric acid solution that has a density of 1.10 grams per milliliter. So what we need to really do, and this is probably the hardest part of any of these problems, is we need to set up our definitions. So molarity tells us that there's 0.194 moles of nitric acid in one liter of solution. That is the definition of molarity. Now furthermore, we also need the definition of the density and the density says that there are 1.10 grams of solution in one milliliter of that solution. And so again, definitions are really important here because we wanna make sure that we are not confusing things and using the wrong definition to try to solve the wrong problem. And so again, that really comes into play here. I've seen density used for a number of different applications, a number of different um, uh, problems by students and often is applied incorrectly. And when it's applied incorrectly, the issues that come from that are the incorrect answers and usually some really bad kinds of uh, mistakes um, that just generally don't make a whole lot of sense when you start to look at them holistically. So with these definitions in mind, to go to molality, little m, I need moles of nitric acid divided by kilograms of water. Now, like, now we should be able to recognize that we can use this same definition and already fill in the numerator of this fraction. The 0 0.194, 194 moles of nitric acid here can be used here as well. The calculations that we have to do really are to convert this one liter of solution into kilograms of water. And so to that end, here's where we can start to use our definitions. We can use our, our brains here. One liter of solution. That's what we're starting with ultimately. Now this one here is an exact one. Um, so, let's kind of work our way through the conversions that we need to do. And so 
I know that one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. So now I've got 1,000 milliliters of solution. And I know that every milliliter of solution is equal to 1.10 grams of solution. And that's coming just from our definition of density. So I've canceled out the liters. I've canceled out the milliliters. Now I've got grams of solution. And so we're going to take a pause here and calculate that out. And we're going to get 1,100 grams of solution. Now that's still not the kilograms of water that we need, but we know that the solution has two components. It has the water component and it has the nitric acid component. And so if we can figure out the nitric acid component, we can subtract that from this total and get left with the water component that we need. All that's missing there is I've got 0.1, Nine four moles of nitric acid. And I need the molar mass. Molar mass of hydrogen is 1.01. .01. Molar mass of nitrogen is 14.01. .01. Molar mass of oxygen is 16, and there are three of them. So my total mass is 63.02 grams of nitric acid. Got that on the wrong side. Per one mole of nitric acid. And so you can see your moles of nitric acid cancel out there. And so 63.02 times 0.194 would give you 12.2 grams of nitric acid. And so now I've got my total mass of solution. I've got my mass of solute, nitric acid. If I subtract these two from each other, 1100 minus 12.2. Um, and for sig figs, um, not gonna be super important here, but um, just for consistency, I had three significant figures. So that zero was significant there. This two is significant there. If I do the subtraction, I get 1087.8 grams of water. Since we are subtracting, it is the decimal place that matters. So I had the 10 spot and the tenths spot as significant digits. I'm going to round to the leftmost significant digit. And so I end up with 1090 grams of water, which is equal to 1.09 kilograms of water. And so now, now I've got the full picture. I can calculate my molality because now I have a number of moles, 0.194, and a number of kilograms, 1.09. So molality is equal to 0.194 moles of nitric acid divided by 1.09 kilograms of water. And to three significant figures 
0.194 divided by 1.09, I get 0.178 little m molal nitric acid. So what we can see out of this is that molarity and molality often give us numbers that are relatively close to each other. Um, there are some variability in there. It depends largely on what the density is as far as that is concerned. But usually the numbers are not too terribly far apart from each other. And so from that end, um, what we can see is that um, the process that we use is, you know, rather set, rather straightforward. Um, I need to take my definitions and basically the definition that I'm going to fix is always going to be changing liters into kilograms or vice versa. This part here with the amount of solute is always going to be a constant. So kind of similar to what we saw in the other conversions where we were going between um, moles, uh, moles per liter and uh, grams per kilogram. Um, kind of similar idea, um, but in, in some ways a little bit simpler because we're only doing one conversion, we're only converting on the denominator. Um, but in the same way, a little bit more complicated because the conversion in the denominator requires several steps. So any questions about this kind of conversion between um, molarity and molality using density? No. Then let's look at our other conversion, or um, rather our other um, uh, unit that we're going to introduce here. This is called mole fraction. Now mole fraction is a conversion or a concentration unit that is quite commonly used, especially for um, one particular type of measurement that we'll talk about here um, later on the set this morning. Um, Mole fraction is not solute specific. In fact, mole fraction is kind of like mass percent in that any component of the solution can go here in the numerator. Excuse me. Any component of the solution can go here in the numerator. It does not have to be the solute. It can be the solvent. But the denominator does not change. The denominator is all the moles of all the substances. And so this one's kind of... This is kind of odd because ordinarily we don't have to concern ourselves with the number of moles of solvent that are present. We're usually only concerned with the moles of the solute. Um, but in mole fraction, we need the moles of everything. So um, there are a couple of extra calculations that we have to throw in here and we'll have to add together all of those mole calculations to get the denominator. But the important thing to remember here, um, and, it's, and it's noted here, is that we need the mole fraction of whatever component we're studying. So sometimes it is solvent, sometimes it is solute. Um, it really depends on, on what it is that we're studying and what we're exploring. So let's go through this example. This example is kind of a, kind of a catch-all. And what I mean by that is we're going to review some things that we talked about in last chapter. We're going to see some other things here as well. Um, but this is kind of a, can you do any calculation of, of concentration? Because if you can, you're going to see it in one of these examples or another. And so the, the real key 
in this is, again, knowing your definitions and applying them correctly. Now, when I see a problem like this, probably the first thing I would do is actually to convert each of these values into moles uh, because I'm going to need moles along the way for several of these of these calculations. So <clears throat> let's go to the whiteboard here and we're going to start with 75.0 grams of acetic acid. And so we just need to convert that into moles. And <clears throat> molar mass, 1.01 for hydrogen, and there are four of them total. 12.01 for carbon, and there are two of them total. 16 for oxygen, and there are two of them total. It's 60.06 grams of acetic acid for every mole. And so that's the only thing that we have to do with this. 75 divided by 60.06 .06 gives me 1.25 moles of acetic acid. The other component is our 245 grams of water. And so we're going to convert that as well. 18.02 grams of water for every mole of water. And so 245.0 divided by 18.02, we get 13.60 moles of water. Now, because we know mole fraction is coming, the other thing that we'll want to do along the way. We want to add those two numbers together to get the total number of moles. And if we do that, we get 14.85 total moles. So we've kind of done the bulk of the legwork. Now let's get into kind of the, the meat and the potatoes here. First question is what is the molarity of the solution? Well, we know that molarity is equal to moles of solute per liter of solution. And so we've got our moles of solute, 1.25, moles of acetic acid. Liters of solution, um, we are told is 309 milliliters. So that'd be 0 0.309 liters. So 1.25 divided by 0 0.309, I get 4.05 molar, again, molar is capital M. So our acetic acid solution is 4.05 molar. For molality, which is the second question, molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Well, we know those values as well. Molality, little m, 
1.25 moles of solvent, or solute rather, and we have 245 grams of water, so that would be 0 0.25, 245, 0 kilograms. So 1.25 divided by 0.245 would be 5.10 and little m for mole out. And so as we saw in the previous example, not a whole lot of variability. Certainly it looks like a lot more. Um, than um, what we saw in the previous one, but we're probably talking about different densities of, of solutions as well. So we need to keep that in mind also. Um, our third problem, we want the mole fraction of water. Now mole fraction is given to us by the capital letter chi, uh, which is in the Greek alphabet. It's this uh, funny looking X. Um, always gives us the component that we're interested in as subscript here. So the mole fraction of water would show chi with water as the subscript. And I need moles of water, 13.60, divided by total moles, 14.85. So 13.6 divided by 14.85 to four significant figures, we get 0 0.9158. Now mole fraction, because we had moles in the numerator and moles in the denominator, the moles canceled out, mole fraction is a unitless uh, measurement. It just tells us basically that 91.58% of the moles in this solution are of water. And then the last one we had density. Density is equal to mass of solution divided by volume of the solution. And so to do that, our density, our mass of solution, 75 plus 245 for the water is 320.0 grams. And our solution mass, or volume rather, was 309 milliliters. Um, as we saw and used up here as well. So 320 divided by 309 to three significant figures is 1.04. grams per milliliter. <clears throat> and so there you have it. We've got our four different values of concentration or of describing the solution here. And this was all done with relatively few calculations. We had to do some early calculations at the start just to kind of set the table but once we did those, every other calculation was kind of put in front of us based on the information that we were given. Uh, so any questions about concentration um, or, or just solution kinds of uh, calculations before we, uh, before we put this away?
All right, uh, we're due for a break. It is uh, 1012 according to my watch. Uh, let's come back at 1020 and we'll start talking about um, some colligative properties, um, things that we can use to uh, describe the differences between solutions and um, solvents uh, by themselves um, in terms of some of their measurable properties. So 1020, let's come back. Okay, so having moved off of concentration for just a minute here, let's get into the real topic of chapter 11, and that is what are called colligative properties. Now, colligative properties are ones that um, we often will use to describe solutions themselves. Um, and what's interesting about colligative properties is that unlike other kinds of properties where um, maybe there's a specific um, um, identification aspect or maybe there's something that, you know, is, you know, one way for water, but another way for ethanol, and another way for benzene. Colligative properties don't have that kind of characteristic. Instead, they're really dependent upon how much is dissolved in the solution, not on what the solution is comprised of. Um, and so what we really get into here are intermolecular forces. And I know we've, we've said intermolecular forces a lot since chapter six. And the reason why they're so important is because they do play such a role in so many other things. And so what we're gonna look at are the interactions that exist between solute and solvent and how those interactions are going to impact four properties in particular. The vapor pressure of the substance, its boiling point, its freezing point, and a fourth property that's going to be the subject of tomorrow called osmotic pressure. So these four properties are what we're going to focus on for the majority of this chapter. And so overall, we're going to start by looking at vapor pressure. And the reason we're going to start at this spot is because this is probably what the, we're the most familiar with. We talked about vapor pressure in chapter six. The idea that when something evaporates, it is going to exert a pressure on the container that it is in. In particular, if we have a container that um, is trapped in some kind of a way and the gas molecules are unable to leave the container, then that trapped gas is going to exert a pressure on the walls of that container. And that is what we call its vapor pressure. Now, assuming that we have this gas that is trapped, what we're gonna see is an equilibrium that exists between the two phases, where some liquid molecules are going to evaporate and become gases, some gas molecules are gonna recondense and become liquids. And we're gonna see this interplay but the interplay between the solid and, or between the liquid and the gas is going to be at an even rate. Now, if we take the lid off of this thing and these gas molecules are able to escape, then the equilibrium will no longer exist. And what we'll have is that liquid will seek to replace the gas that is lost and we'll see even more evaporation take place over time. This is more or less what happens when a puddle evaporates in the hot sun. Um, as the sun starts to beat down on it, it's not going to boil it all away. The temperature's not nearly that hot, but it's going to evaporate the, the water in the puddle. And as it evaporates, that vapor is going to have all of this space to work in. And plus, Ordinarily speaking, especially here in Indiana, there's usually wind or at least moving air 
that can push out that excess vapor and disrupt that equilibrium and cause more evaporation to occur. And so the more wind that there is with that heat, the more evaporation is going to occur and occur rapidly. Now, the relationship between vapor pressure and boiling point is one that we've discussed a little bit in the past, but we need to make sure we say explicitly. When the vapor pressure of a liquid matches the atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere, then what we have is no longer considered evaporation, but rather boiling. And so when my vapor pressure reaches the atmospheric pressure, which is about 760 millimeters of mercury, then we say that the substance is boiling. Now, what we're looking at here is the vapor pressure exerted by a solvent. This is the vapor pressure and the evaporation of water being depicted here. What changes when we go from just looking at pure water to looking at a solution? Well, in terms of overall factor, we know that vapor pressure and intermolecular forces are directly related to each other in the sense that when our intermolecular forces are strong, our vapor pressure is going to decrease because of the strength of that liquid in keeping those liquid materials in the gas or in the liquid phase and not allowing them to go into the gas phase. But if we introduce a non-volatile solute, and the key word there is non-volatile. And what we mean by non-volatile is the solute does not evaporate. In those situations, Then what we bank on is the increase in intermolecular forces in the solvent. So we've got that increase of intermolecular forces, we put them together, and then we get into, okay, I've got this increase in intermolecular forces, the solute is going to help to keep the solvent bound into the liquid phase. And what we're going to see is an increase in intermolecular forces and therefore a decrease in vapor pressure. So that's ultimately what we're looking at when we have non-volatile solutes present. Now, if we have a volatile solute present, then things get a little bit more funky. We'll talk about that in just a second. We can measure the impact of that solute on the vapor pressure using something called Raoult's law. Now, Raoult's law says that the vapor pressure of a solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent multiplied by its normal vapor pressure. And so to that end, the more solute we add, the lower this mole fraction tends to be the bigger of an impact it's going to have on the vapor pressure. And again, this is a colligative property, meaning the identity does not make a difference. I don't care what the solute is. If it dissolves, then it is going to help to pull down that vapor pressure by holding in those solute and those solvent particles more tightly. Now, if we are dealing with a volatile solute, that is something that evaporates also, if we're dealing with that kind of scenario, then we have to treat things a little bit differently because in that case, what really is happening is we've got multiple components that are capable of evaporating. And what we have to do is apply Raoult's law to each of them.
So this kind of combines two concepts. There's the concept here known as Raoult's law. The mole fraction of a substance multiplied by its normal vapor pressure is the pressure of that substance. Um, and also something called Dalton's law of partial pressures. In Dalton's law, sum of partial pressures of gases is equal to the total pressure of the gases collectively. And so if I'm looking at the total pressure of a combination of volatile solutes, a combination of um, liquids that are capable of evaporating, then I add together each of their Raoult's laws to each other and the sum of all of those together gives me the total pressure. And so again, we're, we're combining Raoult's law with Dalton's law in that particular case to figure out the total vapor pressure. And so what we'll find is that in these kinds of circumstances and situations, the total pressure is going to be somewhere in between the highest pressure, uh, the, the, the solvent or solute that has the highest vapor pressure and the one that has the lowest. And so somewhere in the middle of those two extremes, that will be where the vapor pressure is. And it all depends on how much of each component you have. So if you have something like water, which has a relatively low vapor pressure, and something like ethanol, which is a little bit higher, depending upon which one of these is present in a greater amount, is gonna tell you where along that continuum it's going to lie. So, it's, it, it just depends on the situation. And that's where those mole fractions really come into to play. And so, um, we'll talk too much about this. Um, Raoult's law in either case uh, talks about something called an ideal solution. An ideal solution is one that behaves perfectly according to Raoult's law. Um, what we can see is that there are situations based upon um, just how well those two sol those solution components interact with each other, um, where we could actually deviate from that. So in this uh, graphic, we have negative deviations um, where the total vapor pressure actually is depressed compared to where we would expect it. And the reason for that is the solute and the solvent are actually more attracted to each other than, than what the law would predict. And for positive deviations, it's the opposite. Um, the solute and the solvent are actually less attracted to each other than they are individually, um, and certainly less than what would be predicted. Um, and so we see higher vapor pressures than anticipated overall. All right, let's do a couple of these Raoult's Law examples. And so in this example, we are dealing with two volatile liquids. And so we need to use the combination, Raoult's Law and uh, the ideal gap, or uh, the Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. And so we are told that we have 100 grams of water and 25 grams of ethanol. And we need to find the mole fractions of each and the vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius. Now there's a lot going on here. I'm actually gonna throw up the whiteboard here to give us a little bit more space to work with. <clears throat> and so we have 100.0 grams of water with its molecular weight of 18.02. We have 25.00 grams of ethanol with its molecular weight of 46.08. 
and We're told that the vapor pressure of water at, at 25 degrees is 23.8 23 torr, um, which is the same thing as millimeters of mercury. And for the ethanol, it's 58.7. So what we need to do here is first we need to figure out the mole fractions of water and of ethanol. And for ethanol, I'm gonna use just for brevity here, I'm gonna use its uh, organic abbreviation, um, ETOH. And then we need to figure out the total pressure. Okay, now to do that, I'm gonna need moles calculations taken care of. So very similarly to what we did in that big calculation problem, we're gonna need to do here as well. So, 100 grams of water eighteen point oh two grams in one mole of water one hundred divided by eighteen point oh two. is 5.549 moles of water. On the ethanol side, 15.0 grams. And 46.08 grams of ethanol or one mole of ethanol. Fifteen divided by forty six point zero eight, we get zero point three two five five moles of ethanol. Now remember, for mole fraction, I've got to add these two together. And for sig fig purposes, remember it's the, um, the last significant digit that needs to be um, examined. So 5.549 plus 0.3255. If you add those together, you get 5.8745 moles total. The water was known to the third decimal place. The ethanol is known to the fourth decimal place. We're gonna to wanna to round to that third decimal place because it is the leftmost digit. So that's 5.8745. 875 moles total here. <clears throat> now to do the mole fractions, I have 5.549 moles of the ethanol divided by, or excuse me, of the water divided by 5.875 moles in total. 
and 5.549 divided by 5.875 will give me zero, will give me 0 0.9445 as my mole fraction of water. For the mole fraction of ethanol, I could do a similar kind of calculation where I would take the 0.3255 and divide by 5.875. However, there's a simpler way to do it, and that's to take advantage of the fact there are only two components of this solution. If I know the mole fraction of one of the components, I can subtract that from the total, which would be one, 100%. And I get 0 0.0555 as the mole fraction of ethanol. Either way works. This way is just a little bit faster. To get the total pressure, I need to do the mole fraction of water. times its pressure. And then add to it the mole fraction of ethanol. Multiplied by its vapor pressure. So we actually have those values all lined up now. Mole fraction of water is 0 0.9445. The pressure of water is 23.8 torr. The mole fraction of the ethanol is 0 .00, or excuse me, 0 0.0555. The fraction of the ethanol is 58.7 torr. And so if I do those calculations, 0.9445 multiplied by 23.8, I get 22.5 torr coming from the water. 0 0.0555 times 58.7. I get 3.26 torr coming from the ethanol. Add those two together. I get 25.8 torr as my total pressure. And so like I said before, when I have two volatile solids, or excuse me, two volatile liquids, in the same solution, the total value is always going to be between the two extremes. And it's going to be shaded toward whichever side has more in it. So I've got far more water than I do ethanol. And so the vapor pressure is going to be shaded much more toward the water side than the ethanol side. But if it was reversed, if these numbers were reversed, we'd see something a lot closer to 58.7 instead. So as far as Raoult's law is concerned, this is one of the more difficult examples because what we're really talking about here is we've got multiple components that are volatile. Now, what if, what if we didn't have that circumstance? What if instead we had a circumstance like this, where I had 100 grams of water and 25 grams of sodium chloride? Sodium chloride we know doesn't evaporate. So we don't have to worry about doing its mole fraction and its contribution, its vapor pressure. We only need to worry about what happens to the water. 
So before we get to this kind of problem, any questions about that first problem? No. All right, so then let, let's look at this second problem then. All right, in this problem, we have 100 grams of water and 25 grams of sodium chloride. And we wanna know what the vapor pressure of the solution is. Now again, we're gonna assume we're at 25 degrees Celsius here. So the pressure of water at this particular temperature is 23.8 torr once again. So from this standpoint, we're gonna do pretty much the same exact thing. Um, we need moles of each component, so 100 uh, grams of water, which we saw in the previous problem, going back to our whiteboard, was 5.549 moles of water. Uh, so really the only thing that's new here is I've got a new solvent, or excuse me, new solute. I need to figure out its um, number of moles. And so I've got... Fifty eight point four four grams of NaCl. One mole of NaCl. And so twenty five divided by fifty eight point four four gives me zero point four two seven eight moles of NaCl, which if I add these two values together, I would get um, 3.977, or excuse me, 5.977. moles total. And so our mole fraction of water, water is the only thing we care about because it's the only component here that is volatile. It's the only component here that's liquid. Mole fraction of water is going to be Number of moles, 5.549 moles of water, divided by 5.977 moles total. My moles cancel. I'm left with 5.549 divided by 5.977, 0 0.92. Eight four as my mole fraction of water. Since this is the only volatile component, the only one I care about, the pressure of the solution is just going to be the mole fraction of water multiplied by its pressure. And so mole fraction of water, 0.9284. The pressure of water, 23.8 torr. And so 2, 3 significant figures, 
22.1 torr. And so we do see this is a reduction in the vapor pressure of the water by adding this amount of sodium chloride. And obviously the more sodium chloride we add, the more that this value of mole fraction would go down and the more it would bring this vapor pressure down. And so really that's the essence of Raoult's law. In Raoult's law, we're looking at the depression of vapor pressure based upon um, the presence of the solutes that are able to draw and keep those solvent particles from evaporating. In the examples like the previous one, it's a little bit more complicated because the, the two solvent, the two liquids, both are capable of evaporating. And so they don't do as good of a job of attracting each other um, and actually lowering their vapor pressure. It kind of just falls somewhere in the middle between them. But ordinarily, um, this is what we kind of see. Now this gets used in a technique known as fractional distillation. In fractional distillation, what we do is we use these competing um, vapor pressures and boiling points and their different volatilities to selectively remove um, different volatile components from a, of a solution from each other. And probably the most common of these is when we do this with crude oil. So the process of cracking and distilling crude oil to make different components for um, precursor polymers or kerosene or diesel fuel or gasoline or um, whatever um, is probably the most common application. And so what happens is the crude oil gets pumped into the, the vat here. As it is heated, the um, substances that are more volatile continue to rise into the cylinder. And what happens is that it's very hot down here. As it goes up the fractioning tower, the temperatures in here get cooler and cooler until uh, we start to see, okay, um, at, the higher at the higher points, we've got very cool, and so only the lowest um, boiling components can actually evaporate si significantly here, and we separate those, and these become your uh, liquefied petroleum gases or your gasolines. Um, the component here in the middle is your kerosenes. <laughs> The component here uh, coming down, we start to see diesel oils and then heating oils, uh, oils used for lubrication. And then over time, what happens is the remainder, um, the stuff that just doesn't evaporate, this becomes the basis for your asphalts and your tars. Now this can be done on a much smaller scale. And for those of you that take organic chemistry, you will do an experiment like this. Um, where we have a fractioning column, um, which helps us to separate the uh, more volatile components uh, from each other. And so at the higher end of the column, we get the things that are easier to evaporate and can evaporate at lower temperatures. And eventually they make their way down here um, through our condensing tube um, and cool down and can be collected here. And the components that are more heavy more um, uh, have greater intermolecular forces require more energy to start to get left behind over time. So we're at a good stopping place. We'll come back to this tomorrow and talk about um, how vapor pressure can impact other phase changes. Um, and that'll lead us into our discussion of freezing point and boiling point. And then we'll also get to osmotic pressure as well tomorrow. Um, any questions before we call it a day for today? I don't have any.